Let us start with Fatiha. Fatiha. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين رحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وأهل بيت التيبين التاهرين المعصومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا ابن رسول الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لك الفداء يا غريب يا مظلوم يا شهيد بأرض كربلاء ثم السلام عليكم يا أهل الأرض الحسين مظلوم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته We have come together on a very solemn day in the Muslim calendar. I would even claim that there is something about this day which is a remnant of a reminder that it is part of the human tragedy to think about the battle for justice and the way that battle is fought. History is full of those events in which leaders have fought and leaders have come forward with a solution to the problems of injustice. I would say that human history represents what Imam Ali says in Nahjul Balagha that the Quran came to teach us what is right and what is wrong. And the battle has been there since human beings were created on this earth. The thesis that I want to project tonight and for you to remember that this is something that we have reflected upon today's events is very important. Human beings will not commit themselves to do the good until they know in truth what is good. There is something about human beings. It's in the nature of human beings. Because Islam is clearly teaching us that, it's, that human beings are not born with a defect. They are, no, they are not born with an original sin. What they are born with is a potential to become perfected. This is what is conveyed in Surah Al-Rum فَأَقِمْ وَجْحَكَ لِلدِّينِ عَنِيفَ فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ لَتِ فَتَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا The fitra that we are talking about is the divine fitra. It's the divine nature with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed all human beings. We all have that fitra in us. Had it not been so, there would be no way for us to be guided. When we say, Hidina Sirat al Mustaqim, we are talking about the potential that you and I have in order to be guided. If we become misguided, that's our choice. 
I want to make it very clear that Allah does not misguide if He is the one who is creating the nature that is to be guided. But that nature is under the pressure and under the stress of history. The way events unfold in our lives, they push us in one or the other direction. That force in us is what we call the blessing that God has provided to all the human beings. There is no human person who can say, I was not given that. On the day of judgment, there is no argument by any human being that they were not guided with the basic guidance. The basic guidance is for you and me to recognize what is right from what is wrong. That's the basic guidance. But the basic guidance, which is the nature of human being, this is the fitrat Allah allati fatara nasa alayha, is the one that is under the pressure and under the influence of the time and space. You are living under the conditions which do not let you see the true essence of your being. You're not able to see it. You're not able to feel it. You're not able to work for it. Because something has happened in between which has taken away your ability to know the right from the wrong. Sometimes the Quran speaks about the wrong traditions that we have inherited from the past generation. Sometimes it is the pressure of the material struggles with which we are going we have to make major decisions about it how do i feed my stomach how do i feed my family how do i feed my children such pressures are what we call the social conditions of the human beings human beings are socially conditioned and that's why Many historians are saying that you can actually predict the happening of the history. We are living in the modern times. In the modern times, if we read authors like Weber, Max Weber and others, there is some kind of determinism that is going to plague us, that is going to influence us and impact us. And that's the way we are going to act. The force is known as the force of modernity. You and I are the product of the modern times. In modern times, you and I are not allowed to be individual as much as we want to be free. Because there are certain things that are conditioned by the society. Weber calls it impersonal modernity. Where I am not connected with you as a human being. I don't want to be connected with you as a human being. I don't want to feel the way you are feeling. I, want, I don't want to be emotionally connected with you. In order for me to set myself authentic, that means able to do things the way I am seeing them. Today, authenticity from me is claiming that I should not be worried about people who are connected to me horizontally. My friends, my families, my citizens, my fellow global citizens. I don't want to be concerned about them. I want to think about myself. This is known as impersonal modernity. And you and I are called upon to respond to our vocation. I'm an accountant. You are a teacher. You are an engineer. You are this, you are that. We are responding to our vocations. But the vocations are thoroughly viewed by people like Max Weber as thoroughly secular. You cannot be connected emotionally with your vocations. Don't even pray. Don't even pray for the success of your vocation. In fact, he wrote an essay for the physicians. And he praised the physicians in Germany, saying that 
you need to be like the physicians in America. Because America is different. And you are connected with your professional duties. And you are guided by your professional ethics. But those ethics are not connected with human beings. In a very challenging ayah in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim. We read this, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Lakada Arsalna Musa bi ayatina. Lakad Arsalna Musa bi ayatina. Fakhrij kaumaka min al dhulamatila nur. Thakirhum bi ayamilla. Inna fi dhalika la ayatin li kulli sabbarin shakur. This is very, very powerful. And I want you to understand that the Quran is not a book that you and I can read and simply ponder on it. The Quran is dependent upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Listen very carefully. The reference in the Quran is to the Prophet giving the message. So when the Prophet is giving the message, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا Then I want you to imagine the audience to which the Prophet is talking. Don't read the ayah without thinking about the Prophet who is talking to the people. And he's explaining what signs were given to Musa alayhi salam. And not only that, the ayah is going further saying that the reason why we gave him the signs was he should be able to take out his own community. Actually changes the tense. Take out your community from darkness to the light. Look at the way the Quran is using all these metaphors. The metaphor of darkness is our disconnect. Our disconnect. Human beings were never born to be alone. There's nothing about human beings whereby individuation can come about without being connected to any other human being. You cannot imagine your personhood without being connected to other human beings. If that's the case, why is the Quran immediately saying, Dakirhum bi ayyamillah? Remind them of the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Arab listener knows quite well, because the Arab listener has already heard about Ayyam al Arab. He has already heard about the battlefield where the tribes were fighting each other. Dakirhum bi ayyamillah. Now Allah is changing. said, not ayyam al-Arab, not ayyam al-Jahiliyyah. Ayyam Allah. What are the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Imagine what are the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. When you are struggling with something, the truth and the falsehood. You are try trying to understand where should I follow the truth? Where should I find the truth? You are used to sit on the fence all the time. You know, we are, we are very diplomatic. We are more interested in our own interests. So I, am, I know the truth where it is, and yet I sit on the fence. I don't make a decision that I want to follow this path. I'm not confused anymore. I know I have been guided properly, and yet I don't have the courage to move. That means the only possibility for human beings is to think that when you are engaged in a battle, internal battle, your mental battle, the only one who can help you out is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now we understand what is the purpose of Ahidina Sirat al Mustaqim. Aren't you on Sirat al Mustaqim when you are saying the Salat? Aren't you there? And yet you are praying as if it hasn't happened yet. You are still saying, Ehdina, Ya Allah, guide me. Hey, aren't you guided? Aren't you praying to God? No, you are not. 
you are still praying to your ego. You are still controlled by your inner feelings. You are not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You haven't even reached that stage of spirituality where you can say that I am now in conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What? The hadith that was quoted, as salat al-mi'raj al Your ability to engage in conversation with your creator is the salat. When you talk about salat and the ma'rifah, because there are, Imam Jafar Sadiq salam used to describe different kinds of people. You know, he said, there are those, you know, who are praying because they are afraid of God. That's the, that's the worship of the slaves. And then he says this, and he finally says, there's also the worship of Harar, those who are free, free spirits. When they pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they are the one who stand like Imam Ali says, Ya Allah, I don't worship you out of the fear of your hell. I don't worship you because I long to be in your paradise. I worship you because you are worthy of the worship. Wajattu. Huh? This is how it is, you know. I found you to be worthy of that worship. In other words, where can you reach Mi'raj al muminin Where can you reach that stage? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, potentially it is your to discover. If it was only meant for few people. I think Imam Ghazali, whatever the criticism there might be of him, he was right on one point. You have to be good to be able to see the good. If you are evil inside, you will always see evil in others. It's impossible for you to maintain what we call sincerity in religion if you entertain the nifaq. That's nifaq. I'm better than him. I'm more pious than him. Huh? How the shaitan comes to the religious people. Oh, you are much better than them, you know. Oh, what these people are doing, you know. I'm much better than them. And this much better than them. That, that sentence was shaitan's sentence. Ana khairun minhu. I'm better than him. And the moment you say I'm better than him, you are losing the battle of marifa. You are no more at the level of marifa. You are more at the level of children fighting over something. How long will you sit on the fence? Zakirum bi ayamillah inna fi dhalik la ayatin. Wow! Not only one ayah. There are signs for these people in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing in the history. Look at the books of the history. Have you ever thought of visiting a library? And looking at the collection in the Department of History, you know, there are subject in the departments of the books that are collected, and the largest one is in history. Believe it or not. People have written volumes after volumes on history. Look at the Gibbons history. Wells, I don't know how many historians, Toynbee, Tabari, our historians, Tabari, how many volumes you have? Mas'udi, how many volumes you have? Abu al-Fida, Ibn Athir. These are our historians. And look, they wrote and wrote and wrote. They left it for us to read them and to examine them in order to get Ibratan li ulil albab. Kana fi qasasim Ibratan ulil albab. In their stories, there are lessons to be learned. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet is reading the ayah, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا فَخْرِجْ قَوْمَكَ مِنَ الظُّلَمَاتِ لَا النور. He's talking to the people. Can you imagine the Prophet sitting in the... I don't know the ayah. The tafsir doesn't say where he was sitting in the mosque when he read the ayah. But I'm pretty sure that there were people. There must have been Jews. And other communities arguing with him, talking to him about their superiority, that they were better guarded. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then, okay, tell them. This was what your condition was. You were in the darkness of the ignorance. What kind of ignorance is Allah talking about? 
My brothers and sisters, this is not about the high philosophical ideas. No. That's not what Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expecting us to know. What he's expecting us to know is the basic fundamentals of how to live as a human being. Are you with me? Basic fundamentals of how to, fundamentals of how to live in the human society, how to manage your politics, how to manage your economics, how to manage your life. These are basic things. All human beings are capable of learning it. You don't need a university degree to go and learn about those things. They are given to you by your nature, by your abilities to live in the society, to function as a member of the society. Then what is it that is ayamillah then? The kirum bi ayamillah. Remind them what is being forgotten is the purpose of the history. It's not the, the moments of history that you forget. What you forget is the proper philosophy of history. Why did this happen? Why did the Prophet wasallam leave Mecca to come to Medina? To Yathrib? What was it that drove him to go? Now you and I, we, in a simple language of religion, we say, that was the will of God. That's how we talk about it. That was the will of God. That's why the Prophet left Ma Ma Yathrib and went to Mecca, went to, you know, Medina. Sorry, he left Mecca and left, came to Medina, Yathrib. Oh, you and I, we read it in the history, we say, this is when the Hijrah happened. But there's something more than that is happening. Hijrah is in the history of Islam a major event. You all are part of the immigrant communities here in this part of the world. Even the original people here are also Muhajirin. In, the, in, the way, in a way, they have all come to live here. And they've discovered their lives here. With their education, with their abilities, they've been able to become successful in their life here. What does that mean? It means that there's something more between the lines that is being conveyed. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fi dhalaka la ayatin li sabbarin shakur, there are two things that are being mentioned here, two qualities of the people who are to be educated. Brothers and sisters, this is talking to us. Sabbarin shakur. Sabbar, the one who is perseverant under the most difficult circumstances. Cannot afford to sit on the fence and not do anything. When you see the wrong, you can't say, ah, oh, it doesn't concern me. No, it concerns you as a member of human community. That's what Allah wants us to become. He wants to become us to become global. Because he's the global God. He's not a God of one tribe. He's not the God of one community. He's the God of everything that he has created. And therefore he is expecting us to be the citizens of this whole universe. You and I should have what we call in Farsi Wus at Nazar. You have such a broad minded attitude towards life. Did you know what does it mean to be a citizen of this world? All nationalisms are meaningless when it comes to human society. When it comes to human society, everything is just dissolvable. It's dissolved. All ethnicities are dissolved. All differences are dissolved. Then there is what we call Ukhuwa, the brotherhood. We think that the brotherhood is only through the faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have put in your nature, you will always seek a brother for yourself. You will never be alone. You want to be connected. Because by connection you are perfected. You are not perfected in isolation. That's going to be your debt. You are perfected when you know how to deal with this world. And you deal with this world with truth and honesty. That's the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's coming out of the darkness of ignorance to the light. What Imam Hussain has revealed in Karbala is, I'm coming, I'm not going to hold you for a long time. It's, it's not the night of discourse. But I will feel... Being, having failed if I did not use any opportunity tonight 
to speak about what I understand, however defective. I'm, I'm not perfect. I don't mean to say I'm perfect, no. I'm simply pondering. At the moment, I'm thinking about the topic. I'm trying to imagine the prophet talking about this ayah to the people in Medina. In the Medina, there are people who are asking him, Ya Rasulullah, inna fi dhalika la ayatin, maadha hal haadhi ayat? What is this? What are these signs? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing to the prophet, tell them, Ukhuwa, tell them ulfa, tell them, tell them, you know, utufa, tell them all these things because they are part of human existence. Human beings cannot exist without those. What Karbala revealed in one person, Allahu Akbar, one person, I am telling you, if you want to assess Karbala on its own terms, without exaggeration, there are two kinds of stories about Karbala. Stories that are told by the friends and stories that are told by the enemies. <coughs> stories that are told by friends have an element of exaggeration. I love Imam Hussein. I want to say, I want to tell you the story that I think what Imam Hussein means to me. These are known as the riwayat of Maqtal. Maqatil, those stories in which they are telling you about the suffering of the Imams, the conversations that are going on between Zainab al Kubra and, and the brother and the family. And I'm sure there is. There is truth in those, but they are not simply plain truth. It's hard to imagine. But there are also accounts given by the enemies. When you look at the accounts given by the enemies, then you want to find out what exactly is happening. Who is telling them to do this? What kind of analysis is this? That every human quality is reduced to some kind of ultra-motive plans. Because Imam Sin wants to become the Khalifa. And he wants to you know, rule over the Arabs. And therefore, the son of Ali is coming out. You read, read the literature, by the way. People have written that. I'm not making it up. Everybody is trying to analyze and understand Imam Sin al-Islam. And they want to understand the history. What they have forgotten is that you can do the same thing to the Prophet ﷺ. Bring the history of motivation of the Prophet. Attribute it to the Arab nationalism. Attribute it to the Arab megalomaniac ideas. You can do that. Abu Bainumaya did it. Bani Abbas did it. They reduced the Prophet. You know. Marwan ibn al-Hakam wrote a letter to Zuhri, the historian. Can you tell me what happened in Badr? Marwan wants to know what was the role of Bani Umayyah in that. The kings have their own, you know, axis to grind. I wanted to know that, well, how bad we were, you know. And Zuhri is trying to cover it up. You want to see it? See it in Tabari. The Ravi is Zohari. You won't believe it if I told you. The Zohari does not hesitate to blame the, to blame the Prophet Sallallahu for the Badr. Yes. Read it carefully. That's what Zohari does. He's not even afraid. Because he wants to please Marwan Ibn al-Hakam. If he did not do that, Marwan would not take care of him probably. I don't know what were the motives behind it. But if you read very carefully, the Prophet is put in the dark light. Abu Sufyan is exonerated by the historian. We all know. Then you read Masudi, then you read Tabari, then you read some others, Sheikh Mufid, and you find out that no, 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 no. There are other versions of the story. Other ways of looking at it. You think Karbala did not go through that kind of sifting? Karbala did not go through that kind of weeding it and interweaving it and making it look something very ugly? It did. 
You just open Ahmad al Ahmad Amin. In his, you know, first book, Fajr al Islam, he talks about the early history of Islam. You know, there is always, you know, among our Muslim brothers in general, there is this feeling that Hussein should not have stood in front of, he should not have opposed Yazid ibn Muawiyah. That was his downfall. That was the filter. That was the failure. What I'm saying is that if that was the situation, if that was the case, then Hussein a.s. did not even understand the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That means Imam Hussein did not know his own grandfather. I'm not, I should not use grandfather. He did not understand the Prophet. He did not understand the Prophet. If that's what he did. While I am quite conscious, reading the sources, I am quite conscious to understand, to make this statement quite clearly, that Imam Sen knew exactly what the Prophet wanted. And Imam Sen knew very well the policies of the government that he was dealing with. He was very sharp. These were the sons of Ali. Imam Ali knew. Imam Ali made it quite clear that, look, I cannot become Muawiyah. Don't expect me to become Muawiyah. I will not. I am not Muawiyah. Because that's what they were telling him. The Sahaba were telling him, see what he is doing. You do exactly what he is doing so that you can win him. Imam Ali said, no. I will not do that. That's against what I have learned from my prophet. I will never do that. You think Imam Hussain was not told? When Ibn Abbas comes and talks to Imam Hussain and says, Mola, you don't have to go. You know Banu Maya, their swords are against you. They will kill you. He wasn't wrong. Ibn Abbas wasn't wrong. But Imam Hussain knew very well that if I don't go, I'm going to put the entire religion of Islam in danger. I'm being very clear here. Whatever you do, whatever you try to somehow whitewash, you know, the histories, it happens in every age, it happens. You ask me, I'm a trained historian. How many times we write history in order to whitewash what we wrote before it, and we want to write something, you know, that is pleasing to this or that. We know that. We do that. Even in academia, even in the university, you don't have complete freedom. I'm, I'm sorry to say, there is no objectivity the way you and I claim about universities. There's no such thing. There's also subjectivity, because we make decisions what the departments want to see it. Otherwise, we can be listed, blacklisted by Daniel Pipes, you know. These are the Middle Eastern historians who are supporting terrorism on this and that. You know, that's what happens. In the, in, the media is very powerful. Have you seen Rate My Professor? If you go online and see what Rate My Professor, you can see what, people, what the students do to you, how they kill you, how they try to kill you when they don't agree with you. Ask my sister, she's a professor too. In other words, it's a dangerous world in which we are living. You think Imam Hussain was, was immune from all this craftsmanship that was going on by the historians employed by the government, by the policy makers? No, he wasn't. I'm telling you tonight, there was one person who saved the history of Islam in Karbala. One person. And that person is so great. This is Zainab al-Kubra. If Zainab was not there to talk about the events, the way she witnessed them, the way she saw them, we would have been in dark what happened in Karbala because there were too many forces against Imam Hussain salam. Imagine, you are controlling them, you are imprisoning them, you are tying them with ropes and, and chains and dragging them through Kufa, dragging them to Damascus, and you are saying, you know, 
Amir al-Mu'minin did tell dealt with them because they went against Amir al-Mu'minin Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Hey, yes. Amir al-Mu'minin Yazid ibn Muawiyah. MashaAllah. This is the status of Ummah. This is what happened. Can, can you imagine how the conscience can become so dark that it stops seeing the light totally? How can he be Amir al-Mu'mineen? When we have Amir al-Mu'mineen, Abu Bakr, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Are you keeping him and, him and Yazid all together? What is our sense of justice and truth? It's impossible to think like that. But there was one woman who said, I will not let that, let that happen. Bibi Zainab was so brave. And her mission started today, this evening. The first thing that happened today, can you imagine how heartless these people were? And they were praying. They were fasting. Yes, by the way, Tabari tells us they were fighting on the day of Ashura because it is Sunnah to fast. That's what they talk on online these days. You must fast on, on Ashura day. Yes, you don't have to remember Hussein because that will show your ugly face. Or you can fast because that's what Rasulullah was doing. So flimsy, so whimsical. You can't even imagine what has happened to the conscience of the Muslim. You can't see Zainab. You can't see the family of the Prophet being tortured and cruelly treated from this evening upon any book in the history. What they did to them. This is Shama Gariba. As soon as Imam Hussain was killed, his head was raised and the body was left. This is almost 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the afternoon today. Asar was already ending almost, you know. Karbala happened, by the way, in the month of October, not July, the way I used to think. It was not Tammuz. It was October. I think 8th or 9th of Ash October was the Ashura day, in, though in that year particular. And the Imam had been killed and the children and the women were running from one tent to another because they were threatening them. The Prophet wasallam used to say, don't threaten the women, don't threaten the children, don't do that. And it was very powerful, you know, incentive provided that people could see the value of taking care of the children, taking care of the women. Bibi Zainab was rushing from one tent to another and she came finally to the tent where Imam Zalil Abidin was sleeping. Sajjad, wake up. Wake up, Sajjad. Imagine this is the Imam now. And the first obligation Bibi Zainab is putting on, them, on him is that, Ali, what should we do? They've taken off our, our head covers. We, are, we don't have anything to cover ourselves. The children are running, they're burning in the fire. What should we do? Should we go out of the tents? Imam Zalil Abidin opens his eyes and looks at his aunt. No. You should all go out. You should go out of the tents. You can't remain in the tents and be burnt off because we have a greater task to perform after this day. Imam Zalil Abidin knew that now was the time for them to pick up the alam of Abu Fazl al-Abbas. Abu Fazl al-Abbas was the standard bearer of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. From this evening, Zainab is the standard bearer. She is carrying the flag. She is taking care of the children. She is taking care of the women. Imam Zainal Abidin is still suffering from high fever. The only thing I read about Imam Zainal Abidin is to, this night was the only night the Alubayt were allowed to cry, my friends. This is Muslim gathering. 
These are all Muslims in Karbala, by the way. They have prayed the whole day. They have done the Zohar. They have done the Asr. They have fasted on that day. And this is how they are treating the family of the Prophet. How can that be possible in Islam? How can that be possible in Islam? Are you tell me, is it possible at all? Bibi Zainab is looking at the children of Makusum. They are not here, all of them. I don't see them. Where are they? Where are they? I don't see Sakina here. Where is Sakina? Sakina is my, my brother's very dear daughter. Where is she? The two sisters are going in the dark night of Karbala. Have you seen Karbala at night? This is not the Karbala lighted with his lights. This is the Karbala where the moon is shining. Eleventh night moon is shining. And Bibi Zenim is moving. And she's looking for Sakina. Sakina, where are you? Sakina, where are you? And she comes to the Katlagari. She comes to the place where Hussein's head was severed. She had seen from the, from the hill that she was standing. If you go to Karbala, you will see the hill. She saw her brother being killed. She comes there and looks at Sakina. Sakina is sleeping on the chest of this beheaded person. Sakina, what are you doing? Said, Aunt, when I was moving in the field, and I was crying, calling out my father, Ya yeah, boy, Ya yeah, boy, where are you? My father, where are you? I saw the voice coming from this you know, place and was calling me, Ilaya, Ilaya, Ya Bunaya. Come on this side, come on this side. And when I came here, I saw that the hands opened, they covered me. You and I don't believe in miracles, right? But love is capable of doing anything. Sakina was sleeping on the chest of Imam Hussein al -Islam. And at that point, you know who came? Shimra Zuljoshan came and holding the whip in his hand, he said, Who are you? Separated because he was trying to control the body of Imam Hussein. They were controlling the head of Imam Zain. They were controlling the body of Imam Zain. I cannot go into all details, but I can tell you something that there was no humanity left in Karbala. If you want to ask me, why is it that Muslims don't remember Ashura Day? Generality of the Muslims are trying to forget it. Then I have only one answer to give. Because the wrongs were committed in the name of Islam and Islam was in danger. It was only Zainab who could really save this Islam. Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'd aizat aithana hablana min ladunka rahma. Innaka anta al-wahhab. Brothers and sisters, this is the time of izdajabat al-du'a. This is the time when the du'as are accepted. We've come together to remember Imam Zain on this very special night. The only night the Ahlul Bayt could cry. After that, they were not allowed to cry. Whenever they cried, they were punished. Sakina could not remember the father. Nobody could do that. Brothers and sisters, this is the time we do the du'a for everyone. We pray for all Muslims and non-Muslims, everyone. Oh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his very message. We read together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُسْتَرَّ عِضَادَ آهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُسْتَرَّ عِضَادَ آهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ Who do we have without you? Besides you, Ya Allah, whom we can call to remove all of our difficulties. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُسْتَرَّ عِضَادَ آهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُسْتَرَّ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّومِ One more time. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُسْتَرَّ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّومِ اللهم أدخلنا في كل خير أدخلت فيه محمد وآل محمد وأخرجنا من كل سوء أخرجت منه محمد وآل محمد صلواتك عليه وعليه مجمعين 
اللهم أدخل لأهل القبور السرور اللهم أغني كل فقير اللهم أشب كل جاع اللهم أكس كل أريان اللهم أكس دين كل مدين اللهم فرج كل مكروب اللهم رد كل غريب اللهم فك كل أسير اللهم أصلح كل فاسد من أمور المسلمين اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم سد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غيس حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اغز عنا الدين واغننا من الفقر انك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على